Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow. We're three days into our New York reunion. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up this hour, Ed, we're grounded. The FAA halted flight departures nationwide after a key pilot information system failed. What technology exactly failed us? We have the details. And more Apple supply changes. First chips, now screens, plus some plans for a touchscreen MacBook. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman on all of this week's scoops. And well, where are the best companies to work for other than with us right here? Glassdoor just came out with their annual list, but some of the Silicon Valley darlings, they did not make the cut this time. But first, let's check in on the markets, how well those Silicon Valley darlings are actually adding to the moon music at the moment. We managed to see a rally in the Nasdaq up one and three quarters of a percent. This is macro affecting micro. This is, of course, once again, the entire market bracing itself for the inflation reading in the United States tomorrow, which is going to show inflation cooling most likely. But how much cooling? And are we going to see perhaps what exactly the market wants to see? A softer print in inflation. We're galvanizing ourselves for that. In fact, all country world index is shy shining a light on really where all of European, Asian and US trading, of course US trading dominates to a certain extent, but we saw a rally in risk assets worldwide in anticipation of these inflation readings. And I'm just going to show a little bit of a meme frenzy going on at the moment. Bed Bath & Beyond doing its thing, but actually the meme ETF, which doesn't include that particular name, that does include the Teslas of this world, is also getting a lift up 3.5%. It feels as though, well, risk appetite, it's out there, Ed. Yeah, it's interesting. There's more feel good for some specific stocks than others. Amazon having its biggest jump in two months, up almost 6% best run of gains since mid October. You talked about Tesla also continuing to see games, kind of some of the big tech, quote unquote. Again, it's kind of that CPI apprehension and feel good that we are seeing play out in the market. Apple, so many stories from Mark Gurman this week. The headlines making my brain spin. But we've moved from kind of Apple pivoting on its suppliers for chips to now looking at new solutions for the actual screens. And actually, we could see a U-turn on the map, but we'll dig into that later in the show. Interesting, though, one of the negative impacts of that scoop is we saw LG Electronics, which gets 35% of revenue from Apple, fall in the Asia session uh, because it seems, according to our scoop, that Apple wants to move away from those screen solutions, uh, OLED moving to micro LED and do it all in-house, which I thought was particularly interesting. Um, the, the story of the day was flights grounded throughout the nation. In pre-market, we were lower on most of the airlines. Actually, look at that screen now. So much green. Many of the airlines recovering at the market open on Wednesday. Just a single name down uh, and in the red was Southwest. You know, a lot of problems to Southwest coming out of that storm and busy holiday period down seven tenths one percent. There's so much to discuss here. What on earth went wrong? I mean, it's a technology story at its very heart, Ed, because the systems of love, as the ticker is known, but Southwest have been a key thorn in the side. But now the Federal Aviation Administration halting thousands of flights nationwide, as you're just saying, it all happened early Wednesday. And it was a pilot notification system that exactly failed. But now we've got lawmakers worrying about investigating this. They want to see how this is going to influence, of course, some major upcoming aviation bills that are going to be assessed by these lawmakers. Let's bring in George Ferguson, who's our senior airline analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. And George, just tell us exactly what failed, what went wrong from a tech perspective here. Uh, so the NOTAM system, Notice to Airmen system, is uh, a system that disseminates information to flight crew, lets them know what uh, what outages there might be at the airports they're arriving at, right? They might arrive at an airport that doesn't have an instrument ap approach that's working quite right. It lets them know airspace restrictions. So it's, um, it's all about safety. And so that system uh, seemed to have broke down earlier today. And, and when that happens, I think out of an abundance of caution, they stop all flights because they, they can't be sure they're feeding flight crews the right information to go into uh, you know, airports uh, all over the country. And so that was the breakdown, probably a technology breakdown. I don't think it's people. I think it's, you know, they collect this information from flight service stations around the country yeah. uh, and then they disseminate it back to the pilot. So it's a big sort of collection and, and dissemination uh, you know, process system. Right. Um, so I think that's what probably broke down. George, I'm one of those guys, you know, I walk out into the street, I look up in the sky, I look at the aeroplanes overhead, I marvel about what's happening every day of the year, hundreds, thousands of flights all around the world. Is it just that we rely on an archaic system to manage all of this? I mean, we're talking here about the technology. As somebody that researches, looks at the fundamentals of this industry, are you really concerned or is this just an unfortunate glitch? 
I think it was an unfortunate glitch. I think I think um, we won't continue to see problems like this, but we'll always see tech problems in this business, right? Because you're, um, the tech is kind of always catching up with the business. I mean, we've what we've been flying airplanes for over a hundred years now. Really, commercial air travels uh, come you know come into its golden age, mid last century. You built systems; those systems need to migrate over time. People that know IT systems know it's hard to plug the newest technology sometimes into the old technology. Mm -hmm. That migration is a challenge. Um, I've heard that there was some work being done in the NOTAM system, so maybe that was part of the challenge here. But it's always a constant migration of bringing old technology to new, bringing the best to the front. It takes time and the government's doing it, and they don't always have the most money to do it. So it, it probably moves on a slower scale than business. George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you. Ed, do you actually do that? Do you actually like walk out and go, wow? I do. I, I, look, look, I'm a business traveler. I'm somebody that you know, I'm fascinated by the underlying technology of something. The, the, every single day, you look up. Yeah. And when something like this happens, as a consumer, as a technology owner, you, you ask what we just asked George, how on earth does something like that happen? His answer, probably a glitch. You know, it's just, it's incredible. Have they tried turning it on and off again? Right, move to the cloud, <laughs> whatever. I love, Ed, your inner geek just brings me so much joy. Meanwhile, let's, let's geek out a little bit more because we've got to talk Apple. And it's planning to start using its own custom displays in mobile devices as early as 2024. And on top of that, maybe in the future, those devices with those screens, you can touch them even on a Mac computer. Let's bring in on the scoop generator that is Mark Gurman. And Mark, I mean, you're out with another one. Let's start with the Mac news, because I thought that Tim Cook was going to follow in his predecessor's viewpoint on this and not want to have touch screens on computers. This is very significant. Now, they won't fly, so Ed won't be able to marvel at them in the <laughs> air, but they will get touch screens, right? Apple has a project. They have multiple teams working on an effort to bring touch displays to the Mac for the first time. This is the first time where they're actually serious about this. They've explored it in the past, but work has ramped up on these new machines. And this is a big U-turn uh, from what Apple has done in the past. They've talked about how the iPad is the best experience for touch. They talked about how Mac OS, the Mac operating system, doesn't work well with touch. They talked about the ergonomic concerns about that. But the reality is, is that consumers want touch. The Mac can run iPhone and iPad apps now, but you, they don't have a touch screen, so they don't work very well. Right. Kids these days have grown up on touch screens, iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, Amazon Kindle tablets, you name it, right? The next generation of people who are going to get laptops and desktops, get computers, get Macs, they are used to touch. So Apple has to think about that new generation and that learning curve and what this new generation of potential buyers is used to. So touch displays are important to the future of the Mac, and that's why Apple's going to go down this road in a few years. Joking aside, when you see commuters on trains or those flying you know what, what i get is so many people have the ipad with the attachable keyboard anyway so i'm like you know are those competing products let's pivot to your other big scoop which is that starting with high-end apple watch and later the iphone handsets apple wants to move to in-house technology for the displays uh, you know the currently lg and samsung are the big uh, suppliers when it comes to those displays what have you learned in the course of your reporting so right now the iPhone and the Apple Watch both use what is known as an OLED display. Those are supplied primarily by Samsung. They get some from Japan Display, LG. Uh, they're also working with a company called BOE in China to source displays from there too. But that underlying technology, that's made by those manufacturing companies that make those displays, right? Apple can tweak and customize them wow. to some extent, but they're not really in charge okay. of the development hey, process. Mark, I'm just gonna jump in because you're an extraordinary reporter but you disappeared for a moment, which even for a stealthy guy like you is extraordinary. Please keep going. Yeah, so the underlying technology uh, has not been developed by Apple. Now they're developing that underlying technology and that manufacturing process. So now no longer will Apple be competing with Samsung, but also sourcing parts from Samsung for one of the most important components inside of their products. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you very much. Sorry for the glitch there, but that this is wild. technology these things happen. <laughs> Glitches all over the place, whether it's on the airline systems or whether it's just a disappearing Mark Gurman. Meanwhile, well, let's talk about some progress being made when it comes to executive searches. Walt Disney, in fact, electing a new independent director 
Mark Parker as the chairman of the board. Now, Parker already been on the board for seven years now, and he was, of course, still executive chairman of Nike, so some big roles he's got under his belt. He's succeeding Susan Arnold, who will not be standing for re-election pursuant to what is a 15-year term limit under Disney's board tenure policy. Shares liking this. I mean, he had, of course, a storied career over at Disney, I mean, over at Nike, now serves as chair. But his main priority, Ed, he says, is to be getting a new CEO. Who right. is that going to be? He says already the search is upon him. There is also a deeper story here, which is that uh, Nelson Peltz and Trian, yes. an activist investor, we found out in November, $800 million stake. They were trying to get a board seat and the, the board rejecting that idea. But the reason why is that Nelson Peltz and Trian, they did not want Bob Iger to return as CEO, which again was a shock in itself when those headlines broke. So there's things happening behind the scenes here at Disney, but at least they have some certainty now about the new board chair. Yeah. Meanwhile, have we got any certainty on the future oh, of AI? Oh, let's get back to AI because coming up, it's the latest warning about ChatGPT's potential misuse. And it comes from OpenAI itself. We'll discuss the findings of a new research report with the CEO of AI search engine Neva. That's next. This is Bloomberg. GPT, yes, we're talking in again. And there's a lot of fanfare around the AI-powered chatbot that's gone viral in recent weeks. But there's some negative connotations here, potentially posing propaganda hacking risks. Now, this is all according to a report published by researchers on Wednesday. Here's the thing. Two of those authored the study actually worked at OpenAI. And one of them, however, has since left the not-for-profit. But a blog accompanying the report stated, quote, our bottom line judgment is that language models will be useful for propagandists and will likely transform online influence operations. Joining us now to discuss the risks, as well as look, the positives, the use cases, the future of the technology, is Sridhar Ramaswamy, co-founder and CEO of the ad-free private search engine, Neva. And we're going to go into the, what Neva does and the way in which you use natural language in a moment, Sridhar. But just talk to us, first and foremost, about what you made of this discussion about the fear of, of propaganda, about misinformation being used within AI? Because also on the flip side, there's a lot of positives, the way in which you can actually uncover who's behind certain cyber attacks, at least, too. Yeah, so large language models are one of the most exciting developments in the last few years. These are models that have been trained pretty much on everything that's been written down, everything that's on a web page. Um, the result of that is that they have enormous fluency. You can ask ChatGPT to write a little poem or a story, and it'll do an amazing job. Um, it doesn't know right from wrong or truth from falsehood. Uh, so, you know, the word that we use for that uh, is hallucinate. Um, but uh, it is incredibly prolific. I think of uh, these large language models as savants. Um, they can say very convincing things. They can say things in the voice of somebody, like you're writing, if you give it enough of a sample. Um, so it's not surprising, obviously, that they can be used for propaganda or misinformation. That's a problem that we face online anyway. Mm. Whenever I see something, I always look to see, well, is this from Bloomberg? Is this reputable? Uh, so I think the, those kinds of risks are going to go up. But I think there's also a lot of positive potential that come from these models. You know, what's interesting is we went to our own audience earlier in the day using Twitter, a poll, and we asked them, look, do these sorts of reports about the ability to incite propaganda put you off from using ChatGPT? Interestingly, most still say, look, they're going to be continuing to use it despite these reports. But about 20% said, no way, I'm not going to be using it. From your perspective, is this where you step in? Because one of the fixes, perhaps, that Neva has for ChatGPT is by allowing us to know what the sourcing of the information is that we're reading. Yeah, that was one of our big goals. We wanted to integrate the fluency of these large language models into search. Right now, search is pretty hard. You put in a keyword, you have to go click on a link, figure out what's there, um, and then come back, maybe go somewhere else. Um, so we wanted the fluent answers of ChatGPT, but we wanted to be done in an authentic way. Uh, so we set out 
um, to make sure that every sentence we wrote had its source um, clearly put there. So there's a citation. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we could take into account real-time information. This is what we launched uh, earlier um, last week and has been exceptionally well received um, because two of the biggest problems that Chat ChatGPT has old information, it sort of hallucinates or makes up fact or addressed to a large degree by our ability to combine a search engine, which is all about finding you authentic, believable information um, with the fluency um, of a large language model. So we are at the very much the beginning inning of how large language models are going to be integrated into various functions, including search engines. Um, so they can be put to very, very positive use, just like the internet. The internet is great for finding things, but obviously a lot of misinformation and bad things also happen. So we should think of these language right. models as being the same, but it's a tool. Hey, Sridhar, we're so grateful for you joining us from Munich, Germany. You're attending DLD. I know you're surrounded by people who understand the underlying technology, but there are so many people out there that do not. And I know that it's not straightforward, but could you try and explain to our audience what large language models are in layman's terms? How do they work? Yeah, so language models understand the structure of how we write and speak. Um, and you should really think of them as this intermediary, just like a keyboard takes the strokes that you put on it and produces sentences. These language models can take your input, um, but they're able to respond back to you um, with writings of their own because they've been trained on so much text. Um, but these writings by themselves, like, don't always have meaning. If you ask it to write a poem, you know, sure, it'll write a poem, it'll be fun. On the other hand, it might not know um, true from false or like what is a fact and what is believable and things like that. So this technology is very much developing. Um, but right now, you should think of this the same way um, you, you think of like any interface or, you know, like an interpreter um, that can listen to you in English and translate it into, into German. They have that kind of a yes. skill, uh, but they need to be augmented with, you know, other things from real world to be truly useful. And those things are going to come up. Sridhar, we're talking about chat GPT for a reason, right? Because of the news cycle, uh, Bloomberg reporting that Microsoft is looking at investing maybe $10 billion into open AI and chat GPT over a series of years. And it seems like, you know, the common sense conclusion is that they would use chat GPT to improve Bing as a search engine, make it more competitive against Google. As somebody that operates in search, you know, what's your read on that piece of news? Absolutely. You know, Bing is clearly a number two in the search space and they want to leapfrog over, you know, just like we want to leapfrog um, over and create a better search experience. It absolutely makes sense that Microsoft would want to do that. Um, but we should remember that Microsoft's actually a juggernaut in things like work communication, personal communication. Um, and these language models are going to be helping any time we write an email, any time we want to consume a document or a web page. Uh, so the use cases for these language models are truly massive. Yeah. And truly, Microsoft's being very smart by making a big early bet in this space. You know, you make bets for a living too. You're a venture partner at Greylock, as well as, of course, co-founder of this business, Neva. Talk to us about where the money is being made in your business, if you're not going to have ads, and, and if we're trying to envisualize what a language format would be in terms of search that gives you a perfect answer and not a load of links to click on, what, what's, the, uh, what's the money spinner here? Well, so this is where it actually gets really exciting for Neva because we are a subscription search engine. We set out to create a search engine that was all about you, the user, um, and we have a premium model. You know, people pay for premium features like being able to connect their email or work Slack um, to them. So our model is perfectly aligned. Um, I can imagine a scenario in which, yes, there is a chat-like interface, but some of the sentences are sponsored maybe. Um, but uh, I think the yeah. one answer format, it doesn't really jive all that well with, uh, with advertising. But there will be other cases. You know, people are going to use these models to create, like, personalized advertising for each and every one of us. So you're going to lose some, but you're, there are other places where you're going to win as well in advertising. All right, Sridhar Ramaswamy, really smart analysis of this nascent space. Co-founder and CEO of Neva, thank you so much for joining. Now, coming up, what's new in, well, Elon Musk's world? From new potential deals to being grand favorite at Goldman Sachs, we'll have the latest on everything Tesla, everything you need to know. This is Bloomberg.
let's get to the news in the world of Elon Musk, because sources say Tesla is close to a prelim deal to set up a factory in Indonesia, a nation with reserves of key battery metals. Multiple facilities in the country could be serving different fu functions like production across the supply chain. That's according to one source. And the plant could produce as many as one million cars a year in line with Tesla's ambitions for all of its factories globally to eventually reach that capacity. But the deal's not signed. It could still fall through, according to sources. Meanwhile, Tesla remains a technology leader in EVs and a 2023 top pick in the auto industry for Goldman Sachs, with the firm emphasizing that the Inflation Reduction Act will have a positive impact on the EV maker. The brokerage maintains Tesla at a buy, though it cut its price target for the second time in less than a month last week to $205 per share. That's down from a target of $400 a share a year ago when the firm also called Tesla a top pick. And to boot, Caroline, Elon Musk is the subject of Wednesday's Big Take. And what a big take it was. The big take all about one Elon Musk, Tesla CEO, and he called himself, of course, Chief Twit. What else has he called himself across the years? But he might never reclaim perhaps the title as the world's richest person overall, Ed. This entire take from Bloomberg is about the way in which he paid himself, right. basically. The way, and, and the way he's being taken to task in the courts An executive about the way in which he was right. compensated. And the whole point was he was compensated by options and certain ways in which he had to meet certain targets, huge growth in the share price. But for many a shareholder, they're basically saying, look, the idea is to lock you in and keep your attention on Tesla, but his attention isn't on Tesla. Many right. Would say. So the 2018 Moonshot Awards, so much money, lots of it options, but he borrowed against it margin loans to invest in other things. When Tesla stock was buoyant, well, it's not now. So now we're saying, well, what about margin calls? Will he ever get back to top spot? A really fascinating read from our team at Bloomberg News. I mean, I think the only person who got to the wealthy heights that he did and then the only person to have lost, what is it, $200 billion? $200 billion. How the mighty fall. Meanwhile, well, there's a bit of money that's gone missing in crypto too, hasn't there? But billions of it have actually been found in the FTX bankruptcy case. We'll have to talk about whether this is actually going to help those that are currently out of pocket. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow, also in New York. Special treat this week. Yeah, only for one week only, though. Meanwhile, well, there are more updates, Ed, at the moment on FTX's bankruptcy case. Advisors, well, they found some money. Indeed, about $5 billion worth in cash or crypto assets that may help repay creditors. I'm pleased to say Bloomberg Shin Ali Basak is here to explain, well, how far this is actually going to go. Uh, yeah, exactly. $5 billion is probably not enough for the 9 million accounts that are owed money at the end of the day, and the bankruptcy advisors did advise as much, Caroline. Now, remember, that number, that sheer number of customers that they're dealing with here as they go through this bankruptcy process is important because, of course, they're of all different sizes. We know that they have asked earlier on to keep the names silent of especially the 50 largest, which have much more at stake. But at the end of the day, once you're spreading the love around, the money back to the clients, it's not as much as you would get back as if you were going to be paid in whole. Uh, remember, also, they are also saying that above and beyond that $5 billion, there are a lot of illiquid assets here that they're dealing with. So uh, in, in addition to the assets that they have said about $5 billion or so, uh, the question is how much is in crypto, how much is in cash, and how much of that is uh, still worth $5 billion at the end of the day. Hey, Shanali, one of the more obscure headlines across the Bloomberg terminal, Solana-based Bonk. Inu NFT surged tenfold after Mint, but listing attracts criticism. Very simple question. What is the controversy around Bonk? Uh, a simple question without a very simple answer. Because at the end of the day, Bonk, what was interesting about it is uh, really when it made this uh, NFT mint, if you will, and a lot of it happened on Magic Eden, which, remember, has been closely tied to Solana. Uh, they had recently raised money here. Uh, a lot of it comes back to the purpose of, of Bonk itself. Of course, you have this idea here that the meme stock or the meme 
crypto craze is back in some ways, the idea of having fun in the industry right. again, which even Mark Cuban wanted. But what happened at the end of the day is after the listing here of the NFTs in particular on Magic Eden, a question then became very, very straightforward and simple, uh, that question of royalties and where it goes and what control the exchange has over those royalties as well as governance of the token itself that is uh, uh, perennially linked here in some fashion but doesn't govern the NFT community itself or the um, the, the broader uh, kind of, um, what do you call it? Uh, there are many, many communities around here to think about, but the governance of the of the NFT community and its relationship to Bonk has gotten very confusing after the listing itself has yeah. pursued. Not complex at all. <laughs> I tried. <Charlie. laughs> but here, it's only been a day, yeah. uh, it is the reality. It was, uh, these, uh, it was 15,000 NFTs here. Yeah. And again, I want to reiterate here, the purpose was largely without utility. The, the purpose well here was said. largely for art. And yeah. so the governance and the royalties that are associated with them becoming as complicated as they are and therefore leading yep. to the decline in value of Bonk is important. Yep. Shanali, thank you for breaking that all down on the world of crypto. Now we're going to get more in depth in the world of crypto, but first some breaking news for you. The FAA system breakdown that, of course, grounded many a flight today was related to a corrupted digital file, we understand. The FAA glitch also affected backup system. It's all according to people familiar at the moment. So many had worried that this was some sort of cyber attack. They're saying no, the reason for all these grounded aircraft is a corrupted digital file. Very much a tech story, Ed. Uh, literally a glitch as we were discussing earlier. Let's get back, though, to Solana-based Bonk. And actually here to discuss that story is Solana's head of strategy, Austin Federer. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here with us in New York. Uh, straightforward question to start. I, I guess what is Solana's response uh, to all of this that uh, Shanali's just outlined for us? You know, the last half of this year has been a tough one for the global crypto community uh, and for some users on Solana as well. I think when you're looking at Bonk, you're looking at people having fun with blockchain again. It's a, it's a meme coin that got airdropped to people, uh, to thousands and thousands of wallets on the ecosystem. And it's something that the community's kind of galvanized behind and been able to sort of dig into and really find a lot of fun in it. You've seen volumes pick up on the back of it. It's certainly helping breathe excitement around Solana again. But I'm interested when, yes, it's joke, yes, it might be a feel good. But when something has no utility and everyone at the moment is saying, prove to me the use case of crypto, why it hasn't just eroded wealth, but in fact it's being built for a force of good. What are your response then when the next thing we're talking about is a meme token? Yeah, so memes are fun, um, but memes are also a proxy for community. And one of the utilities of, of crypto that's often overlooked is that it is a system for galvanizing community. And so the excitement around Bonk is on, on one level, yes, it's a meme. Yes, it doesn't actually specifically do something. But it is, a, it is a token of community. And especially after an ecosystem that's been through, you know, a rough few months. Yes, to say the least. And let's go there because we thank you for coming on to talk about what is a rough few months because Solana became very intertwined with the downfall of FTX, with Sam bankman fried had very much been sort of a driving force in some ways. Solana become so popular, but they held a lot of it. And there's a little worry that your price would fall on the back of, well, forced selling. What's your experience? How do you move past the fallout of FTX? Yeah, if you look at the beginning of November, a lot of the headlines were doom and gloom for the Solana network. And what we've really seen since then, we're about, what, two months out from, from that initial news, is active addresses are up, more people are using the network than were before. There's actually more validators on the network than before FTX collapsed. So what we've seen is the community and developers all around the world really come together and replace the parts of the ecosystem that had FTX involvement and then expand from there. So if you look at active addresses each day, uh, Solana is higher than all other blockchains at this point. That kind of goes some way into answering my next question, which is, you know, the Solana network, there was the market volatility, the kind of lack of faith in crypto assets, cryptocurrencies. And then there's the debate about the underlying technology, right? And when it comes to the Solana network, I think the idea is security and resistance against censorship. How do you kind of restore faith in the technology part of that story? Forget the markets for a second. Yeah, well, the interesting part is the technology actually wasn't part of what happened at all, right? From a technology standpoint- but It, it the, was kind of, you know, I guess perception is to the outsider the as perception, well. The perception, certainly. Was. Right. Yeah, but the fundamentals of the network are actually just the same as they were before, which is that Solana's vision is to be 
the fastest settlement layer for the global ecosystem, right? And whether that means you're talking about fast finality of transactions, tens of thousands of transactions per second being able to go through the network, uh, what we're really getting at is uh, a technology platform that can handle loads that other places can't. Uh, I have to ask you about Sam Bankman Freed. Um, the relationship or historic relationship between SBF and Solana. What are you doing to move past that relationship? How, what is the relationship in present day? Sure. So, it, you know, in about in summer of 2020, that was when uh, Sam and FTX got involved in the Solana network, and they were building real infrastructure on the network that couldn't be built on any other blockchain network. Serum, which was a central limit order book built on chain, it was the first central limit order book deployed on a blockchain. That code has been uh, taken over by the community and relaunched as something called Open Book. And so that's kind of what I was talking about, about the community healing parts of the ecosystem that FTX and, and Sam were involved in. I think moving past it, though, is really uh, it, it's on-chain metrics, right? It's that users are still here, developers are still building, and there's a lot of excitement around what's getting built on the network. And it's well said that you say building, because in and of itself, the blockchain isn't finished. It's not a yeah. final product. You're still iterating, still improving Solana. Just talk to us about, therefore, your own network stability, outages that have occurred, which you know, this happens when one builds. Gosh, just look at the FAA today. Sure. But, but talk to us about what you're doing to ensure that you continue to iterate and then it becomes a stronger product more often. So one of those biggest investments is a second validator client, which is really a second uh, copy of the system that runs the network. And so that means if one system goes down, there's a second system that can, can step in. That client is being built by Jump, which is a high-frequency trading firm. So there's all sorts of uh, additional benefits that come from that, such as high performance. So they're... they're testing system right now has been benchmarked at about 1.2 million transactions per second. I don't think we'll see something like that in actual production environments when it actually gets onto the, the network. But we're talking about a lot of performance optimizations that allow people to build new kinds of products and services built on blockchain that are just as performant as the Web2 counterparts. Let's talk about products and services because that's what everyone's waiting for. Yeah. The killer dApp, the finally that we start to use crypto, not just as an asset or a means of exchange, but something more with utility. Like gaming. Um, yeah, like well, gaming. exactly. What is, what is the bit that you're most excited about? What are the areas that are being built on in Solana that aren't means? So if you look at 2022 in general, apart from the price, and it's very hard to not look at the price, but the technology is really why most of us are here. It was a breakout year for blockchain globally. We saw Web2 companies, for the first time, build real user-facing products. They've all had some back-end experimentation for a while, but you know, from Google to Amazon to Meta to Starbucks, they're all launching products built on blockchain at this point. And so the, the types of products and services are starting to become much easier for people to engage with, and they're starting to be things that change the relationship from I have to understand exactly how a blockchain network works to use this to something as that's getting closer to the experience of downloading an app and installing it. I want to ask you what is quite an open question, but 2022 is behind us. You know, to your mind, when you sit down with your industry colleagues, what do you think the story of your industry will be in 2023? I think it's it's a story of reinvesting in the fundamentals to create opportunities for builders. And, you know, I think you brought up gaming. That's a real area where we're it's seeing... a passion for me. Well, that's why. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're seeing... Gaming is a really interesting one because most things in Web3 to at this point have been built permissionless, decentralized, and open. And gaming is kind of a bridge, right? The games are still largely controlled by centralized companies, but they might be minting all of their in-game characters or items as NFTs, and the in-game currency might be a tradable token. So I think we're going to see more of that kind of product that's built that bridges the gap between what people traditionally expect from a Web2 company and the stuff that's been built on crypto. Austin, great to have some time with you. Thank you. Austin Federer, he's the Solana Head of Strategy. We thank him. Meanwhile, coming up, the rise of women's healthcare apps with the co-founder of Pepe just raised $45 million even in this environment. This is Bloomberg.
I think, you know, actually the jury is out a little bit on exactly what telemedicine has given us. I think it solved a couple key gaps, but a lot of the telemedicine swing in particular has, you know, swung back to in-person and a preference for in-person and a recognition that a lot of patients need in-person procedures and care that requires physical, um, a physical presence and a physical infrastructure. That being said, I think especially in pockets of, uh, of our ecosystem, including the way in which we run clinical trials, the availability of virtual care and the ability for patients um, and providers to connect, make decisions, take steps, try new therapies and monitor um, you know, patient um, performance on those therapies. Telemedicine there, a discussion point with Andreessen Horowitz general partner, Benita Agrawala. Meanwhile, well, the healthcare platform Pepe just announced a $45 million Series B funding round. It was led by Albion VC and plenty of others at that. Here to discuss is the co-founder, co-CEO and PhD, Mirajala Pore. Thank you so much for joining us at the moment, Mirajala. And talk to us about your vision for Pepe. You're using 45 million. It's going to be investing. You're already pretty forceful there in Europe. You're coming to the United States. What sort of offerings are you providing at the moment? Hi, Caroline. So what Pepe does is we provide support to employees during health stages in their life, which are very disruptive and can be disruptive to them both at home and at work. So you talked about menopause. Um, that's certainly a big product of ours and what we'll be launching with in the US. But we've offered, we've also launched other services around episodes that we've seen in the market. Things like going through a fertility journey, becoming a parent. Um, and then we've also launched our men's health service, the first of its kind as an employee benefit, and also women's health um, service. And we'll be bringing some of that to the US as well. So you've already got clients, Accenture, Adobe, Canada Life, Disney, to name but a few. What sort of growth are you seeing, particularly as we worry about a downturn in the economy, we think about perhaps companies putting back on benefits? What do you say to that sort of narrative? So we've seen as a business, like you said, in, in, in Europe, we've grown almost 4x um, this year. And what we are really seeing is companies taking much more um, seriously the reasons that keep people um, maybe out of the workplace, absent from the workplace, or you know, causing presenteeism as well. Um, really, when you look at these um, factors such as fertility, becoming parent, menopause, and so on, or maybe living with a, a long-term gynecological condition, the business case kind of speaks to itself. None of these are niche things. Mm. So, for example, in the U.S., 20% um, of the U.S. workforce are women aged over 45, typically the age at which you would expect to see menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms um, appear with them. So none of these are niche. They're all hiding in plain sight in any organization of any size. And that makes the business case for itself. Talk to us just basically how you are tech company in and of itself then because you know uh, we think about treatment we were just hearing from a16z talking about how people perhaps are returning to wanting to have face-to-face in-person meetings with some of their clinicians how are you seeing that you're solving a problem that wasn't solved before so what we realized with Pepe is that yes traditional healthcare does a phenomenal job at the point at which you are walking into a doctor's office, be that virtual or physical. And as Vinita was saying, you know, people are wanting to return back to physical. And that's necessary in so many cases, whether that's for examinations, diagnostics, et cetera. But upstream of that, there is a huge gap. And that is a universal gap, regardless of what healthcare system you're in. So think about, you know, when you first start to have concerns, questions, niggles about your health, there's often weeks, months, sometimes even years before you think that concern is big enough that it warrants the effort, the time, the uh, inconvenience of going to see your doctor about it. That's really the gap that Pepe is filling. So what we do is we provide access to expert support. So typically nurse-led, nurse practitioner-led, but they are experts in these areas. So whether that's uh, menopause, um, their women's health, health specialists, whether that's fertility nurses, whether that's midwives um, for baby. What we can do with Pepe and what the tech enables is for you to communicate with those specialists in the way that suits you best. And that could be a video console, but there are so many other options. You can chat to them, you can join virtual events. We have 
have our own content team that works with our clinicians to put out written video, audio content. So you can imagine the barrier to actually accessing help with PEPI is really low, and that's what the tech is enabling. It can be a simple message sent off when you're waiting at the bus stop or, you know, just because when you think of something at bed, you browse through some content, um, but always with access to real healthcare professionals on the other end. How hard is it moving from European healthcare provision to US healthcare provision, navigating a different regulatory landscape? How do you envisage that? Yeah, so the regulatory landscape is a, you know, it's certainly something that needs navigating. We are now able to to offer the PEPI service in all um, 50 states, which we're really proud of uh, for our clients. And that's important for our clients. As you mentioned, they're some of the leading enterprises you know, globally. Um, that is one difference. But like I said, the really the need that PEPI's addressing, sort of independent of what the healthcare system is, recognizing that the US healthcare system, and I, you know, I lived in the States for a while, um, is very different to a lot, what, a lot of what we've seen in the UK, be that NHS private medical insurance. Like I said, PEPI is designed to complement and supplement traditional healthcare. Mm -hmm. We don't overlap, we don't replicate the services that you would get from your doctor, from your specialist or primary care physician. Really what we're about is helping you in that time where you maybe don't need a doctor yeah. yet or nudging you to go and seek that care if you're maybe hesitant or not sure or you're, you know, our practitioners think that there's something to be yeah. concerned about and also being there for you when you come out of that medical care. Marijola, briefly, I mean, we talked about Albion VC leading the Series mm -hmm. B. You had M-Tech Capital, Sony Innovation. We've had repeat customers, your original, the likes of Felix Capital, Hamro Perks coming back, putting money back to work. I mean, are you surprised you're able to raise this money in this environment or is healthcare, Femtech, just in its own niche at the moment? I'm delighted. I mean, I'm especially to have the you know continued support of our investors, some of whom have been with us for a number of years now, and Albion, who've known us for a long time, as well as some of the others that you mentioned. Look, I mean, we raised this round in a context where the business was growing incredibly well. We grew 8x in 2021. We grew almost 4x in 2022. Yes, the market is more difficult. Um, I think there is much greater scrutiny of our financial um, financial performance your, uh, and so on. Um, but underlying, you know, the numbers really did speak for themselves. Great to have some time with you, Happy co-founder. Of course, doctor or PhD as we call, should call you, Ridula Foray. Stay well. Thanks for staying Thank up late you. over in the UK as well. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, coming up, well, it turns out many of the best places to work are still tech companies, but not some of the biggest. This is Bloomberg. Going viral. It is Glassdoor's annual list of the best places to work. This year, 41 of the top 100 ed companies were still tech Not companies. a surprise. But some big names. Meta, Apple, Zillow. Not in the top 100 anymore. You have to go back to 2009. Yeah. For the last time, when records began. Yeah. For yes. Apple to not be in the top 100. Meta, 2011. Layoffs, yeah. changing times, working changing from names. Mark Zuckerberg under pressure. It's a different. It's a different company to one you and I have been covering over the last decade or so. And what's interesting with Meta though is that they haven't changed their work from home policy. And some would say, particularly the CEO of Glassdoor, was calling out that actually a lot of the winners are the ones that are more flexible in their working approach, still giving you right. good benefits. So it's not that that's hitting Meta, although Apple did change its work from home approach, it right? Did. They're wanting people to come back three days in a week. I wonder if that's sort of in some way affecting. And then I wonder what Gainsight is really offering. Oh, what is it? Moment. What Number are they one. doing to make yeah. them groundbreaking? It's interesting, NVIDIA, and then this is, shout out my California people, in and out Burger in the top 10 places <laughs> to work. Not a tech company, but interesting to see nonetheless. And Google, a stalwart, I guess. And I would say in and out Burger, important, because female CEO. And actually, when you go to the list of the Good top point. CEOs on Glassdoor, you have to get till number 20 to Not actually good. get the that a CEO is deemed one of the best and a female. So that interesting that some of these companies are still coming out top, but their female leadership isn't getting voted. There's a long way top. to go in that respect. Meanwhile, 
Great chat, but that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. You want to stay tuned for tomorrow, Thursday, we have Kate Ventures Managing Director, Monique Woodard. Don't forget, check out your podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts. It's been a fantastic few days in New York. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>